Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Today, we're going to talk about prophets and or false prophets. We're looking at the last authority, because I said we'd look at all the authorities and give them a fair share, a fair chance. So we're looking at all the authorities in Mormonism or the Latter-day Saints. And today, we're going to look at the ultimate authority which is the, the office and position of the prophet. And we're going to focus on Joseph Smith. Why? Because Joseph Smith is the founder of the church. He creates the documents that we've, that we've looked at already that are the foundational documents of the church. And everything hinges on this man's testimony for the entire foundation of the religion itself. So any person who's claiming to be a prophet after, because remember in, in, in the Latter-day Saints, they have, a, they have a living prophet within the church throughout all their generations who has occupied the office of Joseph Smith, and it passes down and passes down and passes down. But if the, if the origin is faulty, then we need not look at any other office, do we? Because then they're just fulfilling the office of a false prophet, right? right. Which, remember again, he's the, found, he's the founder of the religion. So if his testimony is untrue, or if it is true, it makes no difference as to the prophets beyond. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, and then we'll pray. It says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that word reprove, it means to rebuke, but it also means to expose. So folks, that's what we're going to do today. We are in the light of the, of the Bible. We are going to take a look. We are going to lighten upon the life and position of prophet of Joseph Smith. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for how you've changed our lives how you've shown us the truth. We ask for discernment today. We ask for discernment to know the truth versus error. We ask that you would help us to understand as we study the fulfillment of your prophecies and the warnings that are therein contained going back even to the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand. Help us to cling to that Bible, the true truth you've given to us as a people, and that we wouldn't be those people who would lose salvation because we received not the love of the truth. Help us to love that truth, cling to it, Though the heavens fall, in Jesus' name, amen. So, folks, uh, you already know where this is going because <laughs> we've already looked at the Book of Mormon. We've looked at, we looked at Joseph Smith's translation. Uh, we've looked at <laughs> Doctrines and Covenants, and we looked at the Book of Mormon. All of them are objectively false. So where is that going to leave Joseph Smith? Well, we're going to take a look at him and some of the revelations that he's given, which a lot of them, again, are recorded in Doctrines and Covenants. And we're going to see how he squares up against the, uh, what the Bible has to say about what a true and a false prophet is. So 
Jeremiah gives some warnings here in chapter 5 and then chapter 23. We'll read the one from chapter 5 first. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, it says, A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will, and what will ye do in the end thereof? Who's God speaking to there? He's speaking to the people. So when there's a false prophet in the midst, in our midst, there's always going to be false prophets. The existence of a false prophet is not the people's fault. The success of a false prophet is. Now, Joseph Smith, obviously, was extremely successful, even in all of his failures. Um, we've seen that although he was engulfed in turmoil, bloodshed, and war with the government on many occasions, he somehow maintained his power pretty much right up until his untimely death in 1844, at the same time that he was running for president of the United States, remember. But the point, who's God speaking to here? He's, speaking, he's not speaking to the prophets or the priests. Yes, they have their reward. But he's speaking to the people. My people love to have it so. And here's, here's, this is the part that makes my skin tingle in fear. What will ye do in the end thereof? God is holding people who don't read the Bible people who don't pray and study to know things for themselves. He's holding them responsible for the lies and deceptions of the false prophet. Every sin, in other words, that the false prophet commits is done by the sanction of the people who support that person. So it's a very, very serious thing. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 20 through 21, it says, And the anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. We're going to test that with Joseph Smith. Now, here's our evidence so far, okay? Joseph Smith, number one, he practices witchcraft. Does a true prophet practice witchcraft? No. Okay? So we could just end the sermon right here, right? We could. But, we, but the, the, the problem is, is that he's been so successful. So we have to keep looking at him. Number two, Joseph Smith is dishonest and defrauded people through treasure digging. Remember, he was, he was supposedly uh, a treasure, he was a treasure digger, and they would hire him to find these different treasures throughout, throughout the, the, air, the nearby area because people thought, I mean, this is, this is, you know, 19th century Christian New England. And they, they thought they had all sorts of pirate stories and stuff like that. Some of them believed that Blackbeard came up there and buried a bunch of treasure. And then when he came down, he was killed because Blackbeard had an untimely death. And that it was, there, it was somewhere there. And they would hire these people. They were called glass lookers as well. And they would look for treasure. Well, Joseph Smith did this. And he would supposedly talk to treasure guardians. Either he made that up, that he was talking to them, or who was he talking to, based on the state of the dead? Demons. Demons. So either <laughs> it's worse if he's actually talking to them. It's better if he's lying in that case. And also, something to note, Joseph Smith, though a lot of people believed in his abilities as a, as a treasure digger, he never found one cent of money for any of his customers that hired him. And he was making a pretty good wage. He was making, I think he was making, if I remember correctly, you can go back to the other sermon, I've quoted it before, but he was making $14 a month at a time when most people were making, on the higher end, $7 to $9 a month. Okay? So I know that, that's nothing now, but 
But back then, that was, that was quite a bit of money. So that's, that, think about that. That's almost 150% of the wages that somebody is making who's actually, who's working, because he's not working. He doesn't have a job. You know, he pretends to talk to treasure guardians. That's his job. Oh, by the way, this is a picture some folks think is the true Joseph Smith. We don't know for sure, but some folks think that that's, a, that's a, the only true picture we had, have of him. All right, so number three, evidence. Joseph Smith communicates with treasure guardians or demons and holds to an unbiblical understanding of the state of the dead. So does a true prophet, does a true prophet hold to unbiblical doctrines? Of course not. Of course not. You can't be a true prophet if you're teaching people through your revelations things that are not in, not in cooperation with the Bible. Number four, Joseph Smith and the golden plates. First, he tries to go get them, right? And then he can't get them. And then they say, the treasure guardian says, bring your brother with you next year on the spring equinox, right? There's witchcraft again. And his brother dies. So it's like that, and he calls him the angel, right? The treasure guardian. Well, the angel didn't know that his brother was going to die. He tells him to bring someone back that can't come back. They have differing stories from his own family members, whether it was his mother or his father. The stories are different about his visions that he had. Also, there's not enough room on the plates to actually write the Book of Mormon. According to him, with the 12 plates that he had, there's no way. No one but his closest followers ever witnessed the plates. The only people that ever see him are his most devout followers. So we, we don't know. Then we had the Book of Mormon, right? It's a false book. First, Martin Harris loses the 116 pages, and unlike Jeremiah, Joseph Smith cannot retranslate them. They have racist connotations in them about the light-skinned Nephites versus the, the dark-skinned Lamanites who were evil, and that's why they had darker skin. And when they became good, they were getting lighter over generations. That's what, I mean, that's what, that's what it says. The DNA test results show that the, that the Native Americans have no relation to the Middle East at all. They actually come from Asia. The archaeology doesn't support the Book of Mormon. And then animals or horses was one example that we gave. He said there was animals in the United States during the time, the ancient days of the of the Lamanites and the Nephite Wars when horses didn't exist in the United States until the Spaniards came. Doctrines and covenants we looked at. We looked at the different changes, how the, they actually changed the meaning of the same doctrine and covenant, like doctrine and covenant number five. The doctrines and covenants on polygamy, which we took a long look at as well, which was giving, called the works of, they called it the works of Abraham or the everlasting covenant, which again, it goes against the Bible. The lectures on faith were removed from the doctrines and covenants. So if it's, if it's true, if it's, a, if it's from God, then why did they remove this section of the book? They still call it doctrines and covenants like it's two things, but it's not. It's just the covenants now. And then number seven, you have the book of Abraham. It was totally false and made up. Remember, it was just funerary documents. It's common funerary documents. Then we looked at the Joseph Smith translation. That's what we looked at last time. The archaeological evidence proves that the Joseph Smith translation is accurate. He added a lot to the Old Testament and changed things to, in the New Testament. We looked at those quotes. Every time he makes a change, almost every time from what I've seen, when he makes a change to the Bible, especially those New Testament verses we looked at, he establishes a works-based religion rather than a religion, which is what we have, which is based on grace by faith. That's how you're justified. That's how you're sanctified. And that's how you'll be glorified. It is by, it is by dying to self and trusting in him, just like the Apostle Paul said in Galatians. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Joseph, every time he makes a change, Joseph Smith establishes a works-based religion. 
Do you know of any other works-based religions? Every single one without exception. That's the difference between the tr true Christianity and any other religion. You look at Islam, it's works-based religion. You look at Buddhism, it's works-based religion. You've got to die facing towards the east. Hinduism, same thing. Pilgrimages. Indulgences, Roman Catholic Church. Even the evangelical church today who still says saved by grace, but you have to be in subjection to the authorities of the church and never go outside them. And if you start passing out books or trying to have a Bible study group and you do it, oh, if you do it without permission from the elders, you've lost your salvation. And they'll open up They'll open up investigations on you and find out who you are and say, there's the troublemaker who's trying to tell people the truth. Joseph Smith, no different. He establishes a workspace religion in every change he makes. Paul, you want to add something? I do. Uh, that is one of the things that really upsets me and how Adventists don't know how to answer that. Oh, well, you, you believe in works. Quite the contrary. I don't eat. I eat the way I do because I believe that's what the Bible says. Right. Not because of what some minister or preacher says. I go to church on Sabbath or keep Sabbath because that's what the Bible says. Not because this one says it or that one, but these other denominations, other religions, why do you do what you do? Well, I have to go ask my pastor. Uh, in the catechism, it says this or that. Which one is works and which one is faith? I have a question for you. And, and what was the issue with Jesus and the Pharisees? You don't keep our laws. Which one was works and which one is faith? And this is the brainwashing. Yeah. That, and, and why Adventists can't answer that. And I love that when people say to me, Oh, you're, you're a vegetarian because your church says so? Absolutely not, is my answer, because my church doesn't say that anymore. Because I believe <laughs> true. this is what Jesus wants me to do. Which one's works and which one's faith? All, every other religion on earth, other than that which follows Jesus Christ, is salvation or whatever they are peddling by works. Amen. Amen. If we go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read verse 8 so we can, we can drive that point home. Verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then Ephesians ends. Right? No more verses. <laughs> oh, no, wait, there's more here. I'm sorry. See, that's the part most of the evangelical world will leave out. Because, yeah, if you read verse 8 and 9, it almost sounds like um, you're just saved. And that's it. You're just saved. All you got to do is believe. That's it. But Paul's not done making his point here, is he? What does he say in verse 10? So let's, let's read it again, actually. Let's read the whole thing. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Uh-oh, work, that's a bad word. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Do you, does it make sense now, what, what is actually being said? The way you are saved is by grace, not works. You can't, there's not a single work you could do. There's not a single work you could do that will save your soul. There's nothing that you can ransom for your soul. Nothing. That's why Jesus had to come here and pay the price, because he is the ransom. You have to believe in him. You have to trust in Him. And after that point, what happens? 
a change is made in you. If you block that change, deal's off. You're violating verse 10. If you block God saying, okay, now I want to recreate you. It says created in Christ Jesus. That's the rebirth, the recreation that he does in us, the redemption that he gives us, the, dry, the, the pulling us up out of the dirt and the mire and placing us on our feet and saying, now you can do good works through my power. It's me doing it in you. God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Not have a free pass to sin. Not have a license to do whatever we want and still say we're going to heaven. While people look at us and point the finger and say, hypocrite, I want nothing to do with that church. I want nothing to do with that religion. And I want nothing to do with that God. And that's what they do. That's why the kids leave in droves. When they, get, when they become of age, they see the hypocrisy. And they, they say, I want nothing to do with this fake nonsense. But if we live verse 8, 9, and 10, then it is Christ who is living in us. Does that, mean, does that guarantee they're going to stay in the church and they're not going to run away? No. No, it doesn't. But what it does say is that you won't be a hypocrite because you'll be able, God will give you the power that we lack, that we don't have in ourselves to keep his commandments, to do those good works. Do you see how it works? There's, there, there's, not, there's, not, there's not a you saving yourself. There is a you believing in Christ and then you're doing good works. If you see good works in someone, if you see, if you see the Spirit, the Holy Spirit on somebody, and you, you see them and they, ha they are doing the works of Christ, it's not because they're a holy, super holy person. It's because they're in submission to the Holy Spirit. The works only identify. That's it. They identify or as Jesus would say, the fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. The fruits identify what sort of tree it is. If it's producing apples, it's an apple tree. If it's a good tree, it produces good works. If it's an evil tree, it produces evil works. It's that simple. The fruits don't save the tree. Paul, you want to add something? Real quick, and I'll leave you alone. You know, it's profound what you said about how when people uh, come to an age of realization in the church, I don't want anything to do with those hypocrites. And, and I mean, basically, that's what I did, okay? However, this is the contrast, and this is what the realization has to come. There is no one in the scripture, in the gospels, that Jesus came in contact with that was not profoundly affected one way or another. Their life was never the same. Right. Whether it was a rich young ruler, right. Herod, uh, uh, Pilate, their life was changed when they came in contact with Jesus. And I might go as far as to say, even the apostles after their conversion, their life did not remain the same. That's what we must become. And is it because of us? It is because of him in us. Amen. Him in them. Amen. So therein lies the difference in my mind. Right. I mean, you just said it all. Think about the person who's saying this in Ephesians. Did he, this is, a, this is the apostle Paul. This is, this, did he have works? You better believe he had works. So that, that, I mean, that proves the point itself, doesn't it? Paul didn't have a license to sin. What, was Paul down at the bar getting drunk and he was tying on his fifth one when he wrote this? Absolutely not. This was a man who was stoned probably to death, thrown out of the city, and God raised him back up so that he could get up and go back in and start working again. It's amazing. So, Joseph Smith teaches a false, a false religion. Number nine, Joseph Smith always gets what he wants, and others always have to sacrifice. Think about the polygamy issue. His wife, oh, you're going to die. You're gonna, you're gonna, if you don't follow what I say, then you are going to lose your salvation. The Book of Mormon, uh, the publishing of it, which is what we're going to look at in a minute here. The fraud in Kirkland. Remember, he, was, he started this, like, this fake bank over there, 
and he was issuing banknotes to people without having anything to back it up. And, oh man, you wonder why these people hated them wherever they went? They were defrauding people. That's why he got tarred and feathered. That's why he got tarred and feathered. Not because he was going out and preaching the gospel, because he robbed people. And does it, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's in character with his treasure digging days. He had the Mormon War in Missouri. He's constantly leading his people into violence. Freemasonry was co-opted and added when he was in Nauvoo. He teaches correct, incorrect Bible stories like the, uh, the, one, in, the one about Abraham. And as, as we're going to see, he has a weak God, a very weak God, because God can't fulfill what he says he'll do. We're going to see that. Oh, and this, this is just for Paul right here. Paul had mentioned that um, the Muslim religion is very similar to the Mormon religion. And actually, if you go back to one of the first sermons we did on this, we talked about how Joseph Smith called himself the, he called himself, his own words, he said he was the second coming of Muhammad and that he was going to spread his religion by the sword. Of course, he died shortly after that. But if you look at the Mormons and the Muslims, it's kind of interesting. First off, they have a spiritualistic view of the state of the dead. They both have that. Um, you know, Muhammad supposedly went up into heaven and met Moses, and he told him all these things, and then he met all these other, he met all these other uh, you know, patriarchs and prophets and stuff like that. Not ones that necessarily were raised up from the dead, but and they have all this, uh, this beliefs about these, uh, these different spirits in the world. Anyhow, also another one, they are, both of them believe they're restoring the only true religion on earth. Both of them have a new scripture because the Bible has been corrupted. That's what they say. You know, in, in the Muslim religion, Abraham is sacrificing Ishmael, not Isaac. They flip it. So Ishmael is the chosen people, and the Jews change that. That's what they believe. Mormons and Muslims both believe in the preeminence of their prophet. They both taught polygamy and practiced polygamy. They both had underage wives and practiced that. They were both constantly at war. I mean, the Muslims were basically marauders in the beginning. They both say that their prophet's powers are always increased and not decreased. Never, never when Muhammad gets a, a revelation or an impression from God is he saying, Muhammad, you need to back up a little bit. No, he's saying, Muhammad, you are my chosen prophet and everybody better bow the knee to you. Same with Joseph Smith, as we've seen. They both establish workspace religions and... Second coming of Muhammad, Muhammad obviously would be the first. That's a typo there. So <laughs> it's quite interesting. So now, let's take a look at one of the ones. Everybody's got a sacrifice except Joseph Smith. This is from Doctrines and Covenants, chapter 19, verse 15 through 26, and then I'll give you some context after. Therefore, I command you to repent. Repent, lest I smite you by the rod of my mouth and by my wrath and by my anger and your sufferings be sore. How sore you know not, how exquisite you know not, yea, how hard to bear you know not. And again, I command thee that thou shalt not covet thine own property, but impart it freely to the printing of the Book of Mormon. See, Joseph Smith, unlike the early Adventists who were selling everything that they had to publish the things that they were learning in the Bible, like Hiram Edson, like Joseph Bates? No. Joseph Smith, he doesn't have money, but he needs money. So what does he do? Martin Harris, the same guy who lost the 116 pages, he asks him to mortgage his house. Martin Harris's wife was not on board. Again, we talked about she's probably the one who stole the pages and hid them. This is what he gives to him after, after the refusal. He tells him God's going to destroy him if he doesn't mortgage his property so that he can supply the money to Joseph Smith to publish the Book of Mormon. Guess what happened? Martin Harris did it, unfortunately. You see, 
When it's time for someone to sacrifice, it's never Joseph Smith. It's only his followers that have to make the sacrifice. Polygamy, his wife has to make the sacrifice, not him. Oddly enough, just about a year later, Joseph Smith is trying to sell the copyright to his, <laughs> to his Book of Mormon. Did you guys know this? A lot, of, a lot of Mormons don't know about this. He's trying to sell, just a year later, 1829, he's trying to sell the copyright to his Book of Mormon in Canada. Wait, I thought that this was especially preserved by God for his people in the last days and given specifically to Joseph Smith. And now he's going to sell it? He's going to give it away? Well, he does it through the... Uh, no one takes the offer, by the way. No one in Canada, said, they're like, nah, we're good. But he uses... What, what's important about this is he uses, the, he uses the power of God to establish that even the selling of the copyrights part of God's will. This is from the Joseph Smith Papers, Revelation Book 1. Page 31, you can find it on josephsmithpapers.org. It says, I grant unto my servant a privilege that he may sell a copyright through you, speaking after the manner of men of the four provinces, talking about Canada, if the people harden not their hearts against the enticings of my spirit and my word, for behold, it lieth in themselves and to their condemnation or their salvation. So all of the Canadians must have been condemned after that, right? Now, let's get into some prophecies. Doctrines and Covenants, 84, verses 2 through 5. This is in 1832. Yea, the word of the Lord concerning his church, established in the last days for the restoration of his people, as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem. Now, what are they talking about? They're talking about a specific place, because this was given as a specific order, they're talking about New Independence, Missouri, which they were supposed to build the New Jerusalem from there and establish the temple in there. And they even had, they, they even had the temple lot selected. And he mentions it here. Which city shall be built beginning at the temple lot, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in the western boundaries of the state of Missouri and dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith? and others with whom the Lord was well pleased. Verily, this is the word of the Lord, that the city, New Jerusalem, shall be built by the gathering of the saints, beginning at this place, even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation. For verily, this generation shall not pass. Listen to this. Verily, this generation shall not pass away until an house shall be built unto the Lord, or a cloud shall rest upon it, or and a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house? Did that happen? Actually, it didn't. You know, it's interesting. Remember I told you when Joseph Smith feels like he has full control, he just runs his mouth? Well, they were very close to gaining this property. But shortly after that, they got, involved, they got in trouble with the government and ended up fighting a war with government officials in Missouri. The state of Missouri was at war with the Mormons there. And they pushed them out. They had that extermination order where they pushed them out. This is the temple lot today. This is the exact location. You see a temple there? No. It's actually owned by another church. He said, in this generation this shall happen. Right? Did it happen? No. February 1835 in Kirtland, Joseph Smith said the following. Again, this is from uh, Joseph Smith Papers, Minute Book 1. President Smith arose and stated the reason why this meeting was called. It was this. God had commanded and it was made known to him by vision and by the Holy Spirit. Then he gave a revelation of some of the circumstances attending us while journeying to Zion, our trials, sufferings, etc. He said God had not designed all this for nothing, but he had... It in remembrance yet, and those who went to Zion with determination to lay down their lives if necessary, it was the will of God that they should be ordained to the ministry and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time. Or the coming of the Lord, which was nigh, even 56 years should wind up the scene. He sets a date 
for the second coming of Christ here. 56 years from the time that he gave this revelation, which was in 1835, February 1835 to be exact. That brings us to 1891. Did the, world, did the Lord come in 1891? No. Now, is this based on a calculation that he got from the Bible? No, it's not. He's just saying it. It's a big difference between someone who's trying to make a calculation from the Bible versus somebody who is just, just talking, just saying, just with boldness, just speaking lies. Of course, he knew he wouldn't have to cash that check until 56 years from that time. So he could, he could have his, his believers just wrapped around his finger until then. That time came and passed. For, for something like that, that that's an, that's an end-all for, for a prophet. To say, the Lord's coming. God told me He's coming. God told me He's coming. 56 years, he doesn't come. Is God just too weak to fulfill his promises? You know, this is the God of the Old Testament, supposedly, who, when the world became too evil, destroyed the entire world by flood. And yet, when he makes promises to Joseph Smith, and it comes time to fulfill those promises, God's like, I, I got nothing. It's a weak God. March of 1836, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in Kirtland. This is from Doctrines and Covenants, 110 verses 12 and 13. It says, After this, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that, it, that in us and our seed all generations after us should be blessed. Wow. Verse 13. And this vision, after this vision had closed, another great and glorious vision burst upon us for Elijah, the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us. Elias is the Greek form of Elijah. He's saying that he saw Elias and then Elijah. He doesn't know they're the same person. Okay, so he's, he's obvious he's making this stuff up, guys. Him and his buddy there, Oliver Cowdery. You see, when you, read, uh, when you read Elijah in the New Testament, it says Elias. In the King James, it says Elias. It could say Elijah. It could. They could correct that. But that's what it says, and that's, that's the Greek version. Just like, just like Jesus' name, the name Jesus, that's the Greek form of his name. His name is Joshua, technically. If you go way, if you just, just had his name in, in Hebrew, it means Joshua. Jesus is Joshua. They're the same name. But Jesus is the Greek form. Elias is the Greek form of Elijah. They're two different people. Or they're, sorry, they're one person, not two different people. Now, we read this when we were looking at the origins, but uh, it's interesting. Doctrines and Covenants, 111, verses 1 through 5. They were out of money. They were in Kirtland at this time, and they needed help. And so Joseph Smith has a revelation that they're going to get help from God. In 1836, it says, I, the Lord your God, am not displeased with your coming, to the, coming this journey, notwithstanding your follies. Now, what is he talking about? They went to Salem. They sent a mission to, to Salem to try to find a way to get money. That's what they were doing. I have much treasure in this city for you, for the benefit of Zion and many people in this city, whom I will gather out in due time for the benefit of Zion through your instrumentality. Therefore, it is expedient that you should form acquaintance with men in this city, as you shall be led, and as it shall be given you. And it shall come to pass in due time that I will give this city into your hands, that you shall have power over it, insomuch that they shall not discover your secret parts." and in its wealth pertaining to gold and silver shall be yours. Concern not yourselves about your debts, for I will give you power to pay them. Guess what they found in Salem? Nothing. 
no money. Again, this is, this is an example of their God, okay, their God who supposedly destroyed the earth by water, and he's making a promise to them that they, they're supposed to come and deceive the people, right? They shall not discover your secret parts, not tell them the real reason you're there, and then he's going to give you money as pertaining to gold and silver, right? There's no way to spin this. And God is like, when they actually go there, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I got nothing for you guys. I can't do it. Is that a God you want to serve? <laughs> the unfortunate story of David W. Patton. On April 17, 1838, we're just going chronologically here, Joseph Smith counseled David W. Patton via revelation that he must go on a mission the next spring. This is from Doctrines and Covenants 114.1. It's part of their scripture. That's why we're including it here. Verily, thus saith the Lord, it is wisdom in my servant, David W. Patton, that he settle up all his business as soon as he possibly can and make a disposition of his merchandise that he may perform a mission unto me next spring in company with others, even 12, including himself, to testify of my name and bear glad tidings to the world. Similar to the Alvin story, guess what happened? David died. <laughs> God's telling da God is telling David through his prophet Joseph Smith to settle his affairs because in the following spring he's going on mission and David dies. Again, is this a God you want to serve? He doesn't know. He died October 1838. He was never able to fulfill this calling. And what's sad is people, the, the Mormon apologists will spin this, try to spin this to say that, well, David died because the Lord was upset with him because he didn't get his affairs in order quick enough. Folks, he didn't even make it through to the winter. He wasn't given enough time. What does the Bible say about false prophecies? We've looked at four or five already. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21 through 22, it says, if thou sh And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When the prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So the... The threatenings of death and damnation, if you don't do what he says, you don't need to be afraid of those because Joseph Smith, by definition of the Bible, I'm not saying it, the Bible's saying it. He's a false prophet. You need not be afraid of him. Don't concern yourself with him. Now, another translation issue. These are the actual plates. These are called the Kinderhook plates. And I'll give you a little backstory here. There were some folks in Illinois who thought Joseph Smith and his whole religion was false. I know, it's hard to believe, but there were some folks out there that did believe that what Joseph Smith was teaching was garbage. And what they wanted to do was, there was a lot of digging going on at that time, especially in the United States, all over the United States. People were very interested in the, the Indian mounds and stuff like that. So they were, they were digging in the ground. And this group of people, they found some plates. They made them. They, they used acid to make them look older, and they carved little notches in them and stuff. And they took them to the dig site and they buried him in the dig site, okay? And they had a couple Mormons with them who were just workers excavating, right? Because these people had jobs still. And so they're working, and, hey, what's this? <gasps> oh, these are some plates. And what do, what do the Mormons do? <sighs> we have a prophet who can translate those, and that'll prove to you guys that he's a true prophet. And they go, okay, here you go. Prove to us that he's a true prophet. So they took it. They ran with it. They brought it to Joseph Smith. He took the bait. We read this from William Clayton, one of his followers, History of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Volume 5, page 372, talking about what happened. It says, 
I insert facsimiles of the six brass plates, there they are, found near Kinderhook. I have translated a portion of them, and I find they contain the history of the person with whom they were found. That's Joseph Smith talking, by the way. He was a dis descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and that he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. That's what he said they said. That's what Joseph Smith said these Kinderhook plates said. When all they are is notches of nothingness that were created by hoaxers. They were publishing this in their, in their different periodicals. You know how like Seventh-day Adventists had the Signs of the Times and the Review and Herald and stuff like that? They had their own too. And they would publish this stuff, pictures of it, and look, this proves he's a true prophet. And then the hoaxers came out and said, guess what? We made it up. And for a long time, the church actually taught, no, 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 they were true. The hoaxers were the hoax. That's how they defended it. However, science has gotten better. And from August 1981, in their own publication, they finally admit, a recent electronic and chemical analysis of the metal plate, one of the six original plates, brought in 1843 to the prophet Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, Illinois, appears to solve a previously unanswered question in church history, helping to further evidence that the plates is what its producers later said it was, i.e., it was fake. A 19th century attempt to lure Joseph Smith into making a translation of ancient looking characters that had been etched into the plates. That's about the size they were. And he took the bait. He took the bait and proved that he was a false prophet. Now, this one I think you'll find interesting. By 1843, the U.S. government and the Mormons did not get along very well. That's an, pretty much an understatement there. Uh, they had a big problem with polygamy. And um, they had a big problem with uh, some of the things that the power that was vested in Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, because he was, he was not only a prophet, he was a military leader there. So Joseph Smith revealed a prophet about the United, a prophecy about the United States that they, that if they did not correct the wrongs which they made to the LDS Church, this would happen. Now, all the issues and problems they had, whether it was in Missouri or in these other states with the government, and we're talking about the federal government and the state governments. Joseph Smith actually tried to lobby Congress to pay them reparations. Yeah. He says, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God of Israel, unless the United States redress the wrongs committed upon the saints in the state of Missouri and punish the crimes committed by her officers, that in a few years the government will be utterly thrown down and wasted, and there, sh there will not be so much as a pot shared left for their wickedness in permitting the murder of men, women, and children, and the wholesale plunder and extermination of thousands of her citizens to go unpunished. History of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Volume 5, page 394. Did that happen? Government's still here, right? Now, they'll spin this. They'll try to spin this, and they'll say, but the Civil War. Did the Civil War overthrow the government? Actually, no. It reestablished it even stronger, didn't it? Because it was the Union who won that war. Now, if the Confederacy had won the war, then you'd have a case here. Absolutely not. Another failed prophecy. This man was just bold to speak lies. You know, me, me and Rita were talking in the back yesterday, and you know, there's an old, there's an old saying, I don't know if they say it now or, or if you guys are, uh, if, I'm sure you've heard it before, but you know, somebody does something just really evil and someone says to him, do you not fear God? And that's what we were, we were talking about back there. You know, when you think about Joseph Smith, whether you're looking at the Kinderhook plates or the polygamy or all these prophecies he comes out with, he's saying he's speaking in the name of the Lord. Does he not even think he exists? That's, like my, that's my only thing I can wrap my mind around, is that he just thinks it's all fake and he thinks he's just, he's just gaming the system here. There is a God who one day is going to judge Joseph Smith for all the words that he supposedly spoke in his name. 
He doubles down on this. This is when he goes to Congress, printed in their publication called the Millennial Star, volume 22, page 455. While discussing the petition to Congress, I prophesied by virtue of the holy priesthood vested in me, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that if Congress will not hear our petition and grant us protection, they shall be broken up as a government, and God shall damn them, and there shall be nothing left of them, not even a grease spot. Again, did that happen? No, it's a lie. So we'll close here. Folks, Jesus warned on his Sermon on the Mount. He warned us that there would be people that under the guise of righteousness, under the guise of holiness, under the guise of submission even and obedience to Christ, the guise that inwardly they would be wicked. This is from... Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You ever seen ravening wolves before? You ever seen, you ever seen when an animal, when they are attacking an animal? And they almost come into this group think sort of thing. And they just, they go nuts. They tear it to pieces. It's like a feeding frenzy. It's a feeding frenzy. It's like when you see a bunch of great white sharks that are feeding on a whale somewhere. And they all just go nuts eating it. That's what Jesus says these people are inwardly. Would they come to you and say, Hey, I'm a false prophet. I want to worship Satan. Follow me. Follow me if you want to go to hell. Is that what they do? Of course they don't. Who'd follow them? Well, there would be some people nowadays that would. But that's not how they come. They come and they say, oh, I have new light. The Bible has been corrupted. I have the answers. Follow me. And if you don't follow me, you'll be lost because you're following a corrupted Bible. You have to trust me, not yourselves. I don't want any of you to study for yourself. I want you to think what I want you to think and nothing outside of that. And if you dare try to step over that line of authority, I will rein you in or if I can't, I will excommunicate you, and you'll never have contact with your family again. That's what they do. They've shunned people. That's what they do. Folks, that's not Jesus Christ. That's a ravening wolf. And Jesus said, beware. They will be out there. How do we test them? How do we test them? How do we know? We test them by this. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Is there light in Joseph Smith? We've shined the light on him today. It's darkness. And those who follow him are like the blind leading the blind falling into the pit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again, Lord, for discernment. We ask, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us, each and every one of us to learn at the feet of Jesus, to be distrustful, 
of men and women who say that they speak in the name of you. But to test them, to test them by your word, we ask that you would help us to become efficient in that word. That way we can rightly divide the word of truth ourselves as well. Strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen us to be sheep that hear your voice and your voice alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.